It's great to see you today. Why don't we pray together? Would you stand? Lord, thank you for an awesome, glorious day. And Lord, we don't consider it glorious because we're here. It is glorious because the tomb is empty. The throne is occupied and our hearts are full. Lord Jesus, come quickly. We can't wait to be with you. But Lord, we stand on that promise today that where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you'll meet with us, you'll be with us. And so Lord, we stand on that promise. We are thankful that we can be in your presence. Help us to celebrate this glorious day and we thank you for the goodness of God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Just remain standing and join us as we sing. You sing along as Cooper leads us. Till I met you I was free 
a little more of that, all right? And I know I'm not in charge this morning, but I want to tell you, how many of you are glad that Jesus rescued you? Anybody? How many of you needed rescuing? Amen? I needed I needed it to be pulled out of the miry clay, set my feet on a rock, put a new song in my heart, a song of praise to my God. Amen? Let's go back to that part. And uh, here we go. My all right. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of your Hey, let's celebrate with some folks who have experienced that glorious day when Jesus came into their heart. Would you remain uh, standing and turn your attention to the baptistry and to the screens? Good morning, church. Isn't it wonderful that we can come together to worship and to celebrate with people who have made that decision to walk out of that grave? And this morning... I am with my friend and one of our preteen students, Colton Henry, who has made the decision to repent of his sins, to believe that Jesus is God's son and that he defeated sin and death, and he has received God's free gift of salvation. And Colton, today, based upon your testimony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are buried with Jesus through baptism unto death. And we are raised to walk in newness of life. And all of God's church says, amen. Well, good morning. Uh, I have the uh, uh, honor to uh, start the recognition of our pastor and the celebration of his 15th anniversary with Bellevue. Had that. I get the opportunity to do this three times, and so uh, rather than say the same thing three times, I'm going to say one thing uh, in three parts. <laughs> and so last night I just expressed my appreciation for and the joy that I've had on being able to serve on this staff, and I think I expressed that for many of our staff members that uh, it is a joy and a privilege to serve here at Bellevue under our pastor. And I want to thank you. But one of the things I wanted to, uh, that uh, I just wanted to relate some things that y'all do not see, but I see on a regular basis. And um, one of the things, Pastor, I want to thank you for is your leadership in our convention, Southern Baptist Convention. I don't know that there's anyone in our convention that's more respected than you are. And I got to see it as well as Drew and some others got to see it up close when you leading up to the election and then when uh, you were elected and you served. And one of the things that um, I really appreciated about what you did, you made an effort to visit every Southern Baptist agency, uh, our seminaries, and uh, some of the agencies said they had never had the president, had been a long time since the president of the Southern Baptist Convention had come to one of their trustee meetings. And I can't tell you how much they appreciated that, but it, it just had an opportunity to speak in 
to those folks as to what it means to lead an organization of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's just not a business endeavor. It's a holy honor, and I appreciate that. And I had the opportunity to um, work closely with him on the selection of individuals, men and women, to serve on the committees that ultimately would elect the trustees for all of our agencies, seminaries. And, uh, and he had a heart to get men and women the primary three things he was looking for is that they were biblically correct in their theology, that they, there was evidence that they were evangelistic minded by the baptisms that they had on an annual basis. And finally, that they were committed financially to the missions and ministries of the Southern Baptist Convention that sends over uh, 3,800 missionaries around the world, church planners all over the United States, and educates thousands of future pastors. And that his, it was not a political endeavor to select these men and women, but it was just a godly honor to select godly men and women that would make decisions that would hold Southern Baptists true to their biblical beliefs. So I want to thank you for that, and I just admire that. Even today, as you're no longer a part in a formal role, the convention looks to you as a leader and gives you an opportunity to speak to it, and I thank you for that. We have this morning uh, Dr. Gary Passens, who is chairman of our deacons, and Susan, his wife, and he is going to uh, take over and um, just honor our pastor on part of the deacons as well as a part of our congregation. So, Gary. Thank you, David. Pastor and Donna, Sue and I consider it a, a joy and a privilege on behalf of our church, Bellevue Baptist Church, to honor you, thank you, and celebrate with you 15-year anniversary at Bellevue Baptist Church. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Hard to believe, 15 years, right? Uh, oh. We love you, Pastor. I want to thank you for the pastor and Donna. Pastor and Donna, we're so grateful for you and um, how you have led us in a godly way, your godly service. We appreciate your unwavering stance on the Word of God. We appreciate and love how you have been a stalwart, rock-solid believer and proponent of Jesus Christ in your own life and proclaiming it to the world. Uh, we're appreciative for how you teach, how you preach, how you've encouraged us in the Word, not just to read it, but to study it, to make that Scripture come alive and to apply it in our daily lives, and how you've encouraged us to memorize it and that we would walk day by day in that word. And again, we thank you for how you have just unwavering that love for Jesus, how you've encouraged us to pray and to pray more deeply, more fervently, more focused in making us a church of prayer. We thank you for how you've encouraged us and exhorted us to uh, profess our faith to others, to be a witness for Jesus, and how you've taught us how to disciple those that have come to know our Lord Jesus. Pastor and Donna, on a personal note, I think for me that what I really love most about both of you is your own personal love and devotion for Jesus. How it show, and that's what it's all about. It's with you, you're showing us to Jesus. But I've seen that personal devotion, how you show it in your marriage, in your family, how you show it in your daily walk. 
Having been around you, I know that you're the same on Monday through Saturday, to honor you to Monday through Saturday as you are on Sunday. And how you've um, encouraged us to do that, but reaching out as you've ministered to us as families and we've grown closer to the Lord, deepened our walk with the Lord, how you've also helped us to reach out to the community. Pastor, with the Bellevue Loves Memphis that you established, how people see that uh, we love the community too. And Donna, with the Rise to Read, helping those that need just a little bit extra help, and uh, how we're saying we love Jesus, but we love you. Jesus loves you as we share the, uh, the Lord with them. So thank you for that. And uh, as we come today, I want to just tell you, thank you, Brother Steve. Thank you, Donna. And uh, we pray for you. We respect you. We honor you. We love you. We have a short video that we'd like for you to see that there's others that want to speak a word to you. And this big old guy that looked like a football player gets up. He's got curly hair. He's got a ball cap on, T-shirt, blue jeans that had tears in them and flip-flops on. And he picks up a guitar and he starts singing about Jesus. I met Steve Gaines uh, when I was a college student at Union University. Well, Donna actually grew up in the church where I was pastor in Memphis. I, I was on the search committee. There were 10 of us. She asked me to be in her first discipleship group, so that's how I really got to know her. He and his good friend, George Guthrie, they sang together with their guitars. And they sang in church one Sunday, and afterwards, uh, Steve came by and said, uh, Doc said, can I come by and visit with you this afternoon? As we talked, it was obvious to me that the Lord was really dealing with his life. Uh, he was not dating anybody, and I knew Donna was not dating anybody, and I felt led to introduce them. I, I think on the first date, she and Steve went sat on a park bench and were working on memorizing scripture. <laughs> One of the things I've always been uh, impressed with with Steve is, is, is just his, uh, uh, how much he really does embody uh, what he preaches outside the pulpit. Uh, he, and, and he was my pastor, he was my mentor, uh, you know, but he, he was really kind of, we just, he just kind of a big brother. And I've never seen anybody that's so consistent so much uh, about praying and about sharing Jesus with people. Brother Steve is really uh, focused on is, is having a good relationship with the other pastors. And uh, he has done a, a really good job of making friends with them. And I think they've been united in a, in a lot of uh, projects or things that were going on in Memphis that needed the help uh, of the pastors. I've never seen him just try to go at it by himself. And he's never just wanted anything just to be about per se Bellevue. It's always been the city of Memphis. We know what it's really going to take. The bottom line is Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. He'll tell you that in a New York second. All the other stuff, hey, there are going to be differences of how people view things, but we understand the bigger picture here. Another great thing that we got when we got Brother Steve was Donna. And uh, they are, we definitely got two for one. <laughs> Donna has uh, been such a bright star and everybody loves Donna. Donna is a prayer warrior, but her passion came from a quiet time that she had with the Lord, which actually birthed a rise to read. One of the phrases that she says all the time is, this is our city and these are our children and what are we gonna do about the poverty, the uh, inability to read, the illiteracy? It is our responsibility. Donna loves children, she loves Jesus, she loves Memphis. Her passion for the reading program that she's gotten established across the city has done tremendous. So she's just sweet. We love her. Yeah. Steve, from, from early on, was a man so devoted to the belief that, that everything ought to be committed to the Lord in prayer. And I can tell you honestly that through the years, I heard him in there hundreds and hundreds of times praying, crying out to God, and I can just say it this way, that for both of them, uh, what you see is what you get. One of the things that I just really strongly believe uh, is that God has put Steve in Memphis at Bellevue uh, at a very strategic time. And, uh, and he's melded the hearts of, those, of, of Steve and Bellevue together. I'm just very excited uh, and very encouraged 
uh, that in these very difficult times and these, these times of struggle, uh, that God's at work, God's doing something, and his hands on Brother Steve, his hands on Bellevue, and uh, look forward to seeing uh, more of what he's gonna do in the coming days. I think Steve started out to be pastor of a Bellevue. He just started out to be faithful. Just give him a chance to preach and Bellevue and their pastor and his wife have one hunger. Lord, what will you have me to do? And that makes all the difference in the world. Brother Steve and Donna, uh, we'd like to make one more presentation. My wife Sue, would you hand the pretty flowers to Donna? Thank you. And again, Pastor, on behalf of Bellevue Baptist Church, we want to present this to you and Donna <laughs> as just a, a small token, but a tangible token of our love and our appreciation and our esteem for you guys. So thank you again, and we appreciate you. Uh, Donna and Steve, would you like to say a word? Okay. Thank you. Wow, thank you seems incredibly inadequate. We are so grateful to the Lord for the incredible, indescribable privilege of serving Him alongside you. Bellevue has historically been a church founded on the Word of God that has always exalted Jesus Christ, been empowered by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of the Great Commission, and you are faithful to continue to do that and to allow us to serve beside you is an incredible honor. And we thank you. We are humbled. Um, and we just desire, as Dr. Bob said at the end of that video, to just be found faithful. When I stand before the Lord, I want to have accomplished his purpose for my life. And that is it. <laughs> That's all that really matters. Um, I've got my... When we were 30 years old, 32 years ago, we met Dr. Rogers at the Tennessee Baptist Convention, and uh, he invited me to come down and just have lunch with him. And uh, we hit it off big time, and I just enjoyed him so much. And six years later, he invited me to preach. I don't know if any of you, was anybody here the day that I preached that first sermon? That was back in, uh, let's see, 19... 96, that's right. And uh, it was a, a great day. We saw about 30 people get saved that day. And the Lord blessed. And then he had me back every year. And uh, when I came here in 2005, we had told our church we would be in Alabama there with them forever. But the Lord had other plans. We'd been with them for 14 years. And the last 15 have been the greatest years of our lives. We have enjoyed church. We have enjoyed serving more than we ever have. And we look forward to the days to come. You know, when I first came here, uh, I didn't know what it was going to be like to follow Dr. Adrian Rogers. And I couldn't believe that just two months after I came, he went to be with the Lord. But I look back now and I look at Bellevue Loves Memphis. I look at Arise to Read. I look at other things. And I believe that we are not finished. I believe that there is much more work to do, and I believe that great days are ahead. I really believe that the best years of Bellevue, not just because of us or anything like that, but I just believe with all of my heart that we can be encouraged today. The best years of Bellevue are yet to come. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Thank you so much. We love you and thank God for you. Would you uh, remain standing as we pray for the pastor and Donna? Dear Lord Jesus, uh, we come before you humbly and grateful, Lord, of who you are, that you love to us. And that we just lift your name above every name and that we worship you. Lord, we, at this moment, want to thank you so much for bringing Brother Steve and Donna to our church to minister to us. 
We once again consecrate them to you, how you've already blessed their ministry, Lord, but continue to bless them. Bless their family. Keep them healthy. Keep them strong for your service. Keep them safe. We pray for your power, your protection, and your peace. Lord, I thank you for their humility, and as we praise them and honor them, now they again turn it to you, Lord. And as we honor them, Lord, most of all, we honor you. It is about you. And, uh, Lord, thank you. And as you said in your word, that uh, we ask you to do this, Lord. Bless them and keep them. Lord, turn your face on them and give them grace. Lord, lift your countenance up to them and give them peace. And it's your holy, precious, sweet name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay. Just one more time as they walk down there. <laughs>
If you walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. If you walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. If you walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. Following Jesus. If you walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. Let's all, let's all stay standing just a minute. Let's all just freeze just a minute, all right? Uh, you, you, can, you don't have to freeze with the pulpit standing up in the air. You can come on up with it, all right? I know you've been lifting weights, but I, I don't want to do that to you, all right? Great, thank you. Our brothers and sisters in California are under a very liberal government out there. And they're being told now, some of the churches have been told, if you go to church, we're going to put you in jail. I want to say this to you. That's wrong. That is wrong. That is wrong. <clears throat> At least I was, that's what I was told by somebody I dearly trust. And John MacArthur and others, I want us to pray for them. I want us to face that way. That is West, all right? Don't look at me. Turn that way. All right. <laughs> Reach your hands out and pray for your brothers and sisters in California. Pray for them right now in the name of Jesus. Our Father, we pray that you would move in California. Lord, we know that you have many people in California. Who love you with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And whoever it is that is opposing your church gathering, we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that that mountain be taken up and cast into the sea. And we believe that what we say and what we pray is going to happen. Bind the strong man, dear God, of oppression. Bind the strong man, dear God, of secularism. Bind the strong man of oppression against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bind them in Jesus' name through his shed blood by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And Lord, go into that house and plunder their property and plunder their house and give them, give your children freedom, dear God, to gather together to worship you in spirit and in truth 
do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. Do it across America. God, we ask you to do it for your glory. In Jesus' name, and if that's your prayer, say amen. 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 Let's give praise to God. Praise to him. Amen. And you can be seated. Take your Bibles, and I'm so happy to say this, and turn to Revelation 19, verse 11. I've been waiting on this for 30 weeks, and uh, I'm excited about preaching to you today. I think it's really neat that the Lord did this on our anniversary date. I didn't plan that. Only the Lord could do that. And uh, really appreciate the fact that we're talking on the 30th sermon on the second coming of Jesus Christ. I want to make an announcement today Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And I told you I was going to shout, and I'll do that, all right? Any day, Jesus could come back for his church in the rapture, for his church in the rapture. Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. The word caught up in the Latin is rapio, and it means to be snatched away, to be raptured, to be caught up. And that's where we get that phrase, rapture. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Now what's going to happen at the rapture? Well, we don't have to wonder. Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says in Re Luke 17, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said, I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. Can you imagine a man who loves Jesus and a wife that has not gotten to that place in her life and all of a sudden she hears a rustle in the bed. She says, well, maybe he's gone to the restroom or whatever. Maybe he's just gotten up for a while and nothing. And she looks around and he's gone. He's left the house. What's happened? Jesus came in the rapture and she's been left behind to go through the great tribulation. Can you imagine having a little baby? I believe that before they reach the age of understanding and they're not, a, I don't believe they're accountable. If, if you can't understand, if you're a baby and you can't even understand concepts, I believe you go to be with the Lord Jesus at the rapture. And so I believe when a baby dies, they immediately go to be with the Lord. And I believe that, that uh, there are going to be babies that are going to be missing. Moms are going to walk in there and the baby's gone. And what's happened? The rapture, the rapture. One will be in the bed, one will be taken, one will be left. Two will be in the bed. And then can you imagine what it's going to be like? It says two will be in a working environment. It says, therefore, there two women will be grinding in the same place. Verse 35, one will be taken, the other will be left. Can you imagine being on a production line and you've been working next to somebody during the day and all of a sudden they're gone? Where did they go? Did they take a break? What's going on? No, they've been caught up. And then Jesus said in verse 36 of Luke 17, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Can you imagine some farmers out there and the guy driving the tractor, he's just gone all of a sudden. Did he fall under the tractor? Did, did he get run over by the plow? Or what's going on? Why is the tractor just going on down there and going off into the ditch? Why? Because of the rapture. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in an airplane and you're going along and all of a sudden your pilot who is saved is gone. And the plane's just going wherever. And what's going on? He was saved. You were not. The rapture. It's going to be one of the most incredible days in all of history. Jesus is coming for his church in the rapture. There's going to be a shout. He said that. He said the Savior himself will descend with a shout. There's going to be an archangel that's going to sound a trumpet of God. And then the saints are going to be separated from this world. The dead in Christ are going to rise first today. 
would have been my mother's 93rd birthday. My mother is with the Lord Jesus. She died 10 years ago this November the 15th. She's been with the Lord almost a decade, and her body is in Dyersburg, but her soul and spirit are with the Lord Jesus. But on that day, She's going to rise in the rapture before I do, before Donna does, because God is going to honor those and pull their bodies out of the grave. Ain't no grave going to hold that body down. And the Bible says that they're going to be reunited. That resurrection body is going to be reunited with their soul and spirit, and thus she will ever be with the Lord. Every time I go to her and daddy's grave, I realize they're coming out. They're coming out. They're not going to be there much longer. Those bodies are coming out. And then after the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then after that, that initiates seven years of great tribulation, unprecedented devastation that Jesus called the great tribulation in Matthew chapter 24. And from heaven, the Lord Jesus is going to pour forth wrath, seven seals of judgment, seven trumpets of judgment, seven bowls of judgment, ending with the destruction of this worldly Babylonian empire, this evil world system that is anti-Jesus, anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-truth, anti-church, anti-Christian. Billions of people are going to be killed on this earth during the great tribulation. Yet the gospel says, the, the Bible says that the gospel will be preached during the great tribulation, and millions of people will be saved. One of the greatest, if not the greatest revival ever to hit the world will be during the great tribulations. 144,000 Jewish Christians with the Christ mark, not the, the beast mark, but the Christ mark, not the antichrist mark, not the mark of the beast, but the mark of the Savior, Jesus. And they're going to preach and nobody's going to be able to touch them. You can't stop them. You can't turn them off. You can't harm them. They will be under the protection of almighty God. And those 144,000 Jewish Christians will preach all over the world. Moses and Elijah type figures will preach. Those two guys will preach from Jerusalem an angel will be flying in the air proclaiming the gospel wherever it has not gone. People will be getting saved and they'll be sharing the gospel as well. Millions of people getting saved, but most of the people that get saved will be killed and martyred for their faith during the great tribulation. And during this time, Antichrist is going to arise. He's going to help Israel rebuild the temple on the temple mount. And that is going to take some doing. He must be some kind of smooth talking person. The devil's going to use him and Jerusalem will again become a capital of Jewish worship in the sense of literally sacrificing animals there on the temple mount where right now an Islamic temple is. The Dome of the Rock, that's where it's going to be. Somehow that's going to be moved out and they're going to be worshiping Yahweh, Jehovah, not Jesus. And midway during the great tribulation, the Antichrist is going to take everything over and he's even going to take that temple and move all the Jewish people out and demand to be worshiped himself. And that's what Daniel called and Jesus called the abomination of desolation. And he will say, you can only worship me now and you can only transact any type of business through the mark of the beast. He's going to take over religion and the economy. And for the last three and a half years of the great tribulation, he's going to rule the world. And if you refuse the evil mark of the beast, you're going to be hunted down and killed. Antichrist will then summon all the leaders of the world, the kings of the world and the armies of the world, and bring them to the valley of Armageddon. And when he does, heaven is going to open up And Jesus is going to come down and Jesus will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. Look there in Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open. You know, good things are about to happen when a text starts like that. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat upon it is called faithful and true. How many of you can say, I'm a satisfied customer. Jesus is faithful and true. Amen. 
We're not always faithful and true to him, but praise God, he's always faithful and true to us. The Bible says, and in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God and the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We're following him on white horses from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with the rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written. Say it with me, church. Read it from the screen. King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come, assemble for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war with him, Jesus, who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized. And with him, the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. This is the word of the Lord. First thing is this, the second coming, at his second coming of Jesus Christ, the earth will witness the king of kings. What kind of king will he be when he comes back? First of all, Jesus at his second coming will be the divine king. Look at verse 11, the first part of verse 11. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He who sat on it is called faithful and true. John, the beloved John, the last of the apostles, 90 some odd years old, in prison on the island of Patmos, working during the day to hew out rocks for Rome to build more buildings that they didn't need. And at night he would come back He'd lie down in his cave after eating a meager meal and he would have visions of the revelation of Jesus Christ and he saw heaven opened and indeed heaven unveiled and he saw King Jesus, the divine king. He was writing, behold, when you see the word behold, it means, look, this is something glorious. This is something other earthly. Behold, a king. He said, I saw a white horse. White horses were ridden only by emperors, only by men who were in charge of their armies, generals, always someone in authority if you were on a white horse. And oh, the divine Son of God, indeed, he had all authority. He had said just before he gave the Great Commission at the very end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus said in Matthew 18, uh, 28, verse 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority. Not some, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Look at me. The devil doesn't have all authority. Jesus has all authority. You don't have all authority. Jesus has all authority. Why do we pray in the name of Jesus? Because when we pray in the name of Jesus, we tap into the one who has all authority. And when you pray, you need to pray in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. People say, well, why should I listen to you share the gospel? Why do you think Christianity is any more important than anybody else? Because because Jesus has authorized us. That's why we have authority that comes from him. 1 Peter 3, now Christ has gone to heaven. He's seated in the place of honor next to God. That's the right hand of God, the place of honor and authority and favor. And all the angels and all the authorities and all the powers accept his authority. Jesus is 100% man, 100% God simultaneously. He is the perfect God man. He's just as much man as if he were not God. He's just as much God as if he were not man, the perfect God man. 
at the beginning of Revelation, we saw Jesus in this elevated divine setting in Revelation 1, verse 12 and follow me. Look on the screen and you can follow. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, the lampstands were the local churches. In the middle of the church, you want to know where Jesus is? He's with his people. He's with his church. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool. That talks about his eternality, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. That talks about his omniscience. He knows everything. He can see everything. His feet were like burnished bronze. That's his stability when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. He's the commander and he gives forth a commanding challenge and command. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. That's the word of God. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. That's the holiness of Jesus. When I saw him, John said, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me. That's the hand of honor saying, do not be afraid. I'm the first. I'm the last. I am the alpha. I'm the omega. I'm the beginning. I'm the end and the living one. And I was dead, but behold, there it is again. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. He didn't just rise from the dead. He rose from the dead, never to die again. The only one ever to do that thus far. And I have the keys. I like to be around the guy with the keys. They can get in when nobody else can get in, man. I have the keys to death and to hell or Hades. Now that is what John saw. He saw the divine, faithful, and true King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is the divine king, and he's coming back to this earth. He's not only the divine king, he's also the judicial king. Look at verse, the last part of verse 11. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. Well, I'm so grateful that God is a God of grace, aren't you? But the same God who forgives is also the God who judges in wrath. Judges in wrath. When Jesus came to the earth the first time, He came to bring salvation. He saved in Jericho a man named Zacchaeus. And after he did it, he said in Luke 19, 10, for the son of man has come. Why did you come, Jesus? To seek and to save that which was lost. And then to another man that was lost, who was a seeker, Nicodemus, He said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But right after he said that in John 3, 17, he said, for God did not send the son into the world to judge the world. That is the first time I came, I didn't come to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Oh, at his first coming, he came to bring salvation. But look at me. That's not what he's coming for in his second coming. In his second coming, he will bring judgment to the world, and he will be the judicial king, and he will judge the world in righteousness. That means he will not be a corrupt judge. You will not be able to buy him out or to pay him off and to get whatever you want out of him. No, he will judge sinners justly and wage war righteously. And by the way, Do you know who's going to stand before him? You. Everybody and me. Oh, we won't. We're Christians. We're not going to stand before the judge. Paul wrote to Christians in Rome and in Corinth and said, yes, he took your judgment upon him when he died on the cross. Yes, you're forgiven, but For rewards, you're going to stand before the Lord and answer for every word you've spoken and every action you've done. The Bible says in Romans 14, 10, but you, why do you judge your brother? Are you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? Boy, we ought to put that on social media, amen? You can take a cheap shot at people on social media, and many people do it. 
Why? Why do you judge your brother? Again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all, everybody say all. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. He's talking to Christians. He's writing to Christians. Christians will stand before the judgment seat of God. He also said to 2 Corinthians 5, 10, to the Corinthian church, for we must all, there it is again, appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in his body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Revelation 22, verse 12, Jesus said, behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. My reward is with me. That's what it's about with Christians to render to every man according to what he's done. When you get saved, you're going to heaven, but some will have more rewards than others. And that will all be determined when you stand before Jesus and he reviews your life. The Supreme Court of the United States is not the Supreme Court. Jesus is. Jesus is. And his second coming, he's coming back as the judicial king. He's also coming as the all-knowing king. Look at verse 12. His eyes are a flame of fire. What does that mean? He can see right through you. Have you ever met somebody that you just feel like they're looking right through you? I mean, you've got your kind of facade on, you got your mask on, and yet you say, that person's looking right through me. Look at me. I don't know about people doing that, but I know this, Jesus can do that. He can look right through your little pretense on the outside. His eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. Let's talk about that phrase just a moment. His eyes are a flame of fire. It refers to the fact that he knows everything because he sees everything. When I was growing up just north of here in Dyersburg, I used to listen to country music. That's, that's not a, any kind of news flash to you. I know you already know that if you've ever heard me preach much. And I would listen to a man named Charlie Rich. I believe he was out of Memphis. I'm not sure. But he had a song called, No One Knows What Goes On Behind Closed Doors. I got news for you, Charlie. You're wrong. Jesus knows. Shut the door. You can't lock Jesus out. You say, I'll just, I'll just mute him. You can't mute Jesus. Well, I'll just uh, unfollow him. You can't unfollow Jesus. You can't ban Jesus. Jesus goes where Jesus wants to go, and Jesus knows everything about you. Did you hear what I said? Jesus knows every thought you think. You say, uh-oh right? But he still loves you. He doesn't love your sin, but he knows you. Look at me. You don't even know yourself. You think you know yourself. You don't know yourself. Well, if I know myself, you don't. Well, if I know my heart, you don't. Jeremiah said, nobody can know the human heart except God. God knows you inside out. Jesus knows you inside out. He's the all knowing God. His eyes are like a flame of fire. What did the psalmist say? In Psalm 139, oh Lord, you've examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down, when I stand up. When you sat down a while ago, Jesus knew it. When you stood up a while ago, if you did, Jesus knew it. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say, even before I say it, Lord. How many of you wish you could know what you were going to say before you know it? Amen. Jesus already knows. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. That is, you're out there in front of me, you're with me, and you're behind me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Now, these words I'm about to read to you are why I will never vote for anybody that is for abortion. Ever, never, ever, never. Ever, never. Why? Because these verses prove that life begins at conception. Listen to this. He's talking to God. You made all the delicate 
inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Before I was born, I was a somebody, not just a mass of flesh, not just an attachment to a woman. No, I was an individual. And you saw me. And then he says, watch this. You saw my future. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Look at me. Jesus knows you better than anybody knows you. He knows your past, present, and future. He knows your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. He knows your good, your bad, and your ugly. He knows you fully. We're all sinners. Nobody can stand the full light of day. If, look at me. There's not a person in this room. There's not, before you get all high and mighty about how bad somebody else is, there's not a person in this room that won't, would want all of your thoughts put on these screens right here. There's not one person in this room that would want all of your thoughts put on this screen. Am I right? Not a one of you. But God knows every thought you've ever had. God knows every action you've ever done. But look at me. The good thing is, that's why he sent Jesus to die for your sins. And he did. He died for every sinful thought, action, whatever word you spoke, even the ones you muttered you thought nobody heard. Jesus heard it. I want to say this to you. The only one that knows everything about you is the one who loves you most. Jesus Christ is coming as the all-knowing king. He's also coming as the conquering king. Look at verse 13. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Where did that blood come from? And his name is called the Word of God. At his second coming, he's coming with a robe dipped in blood, not his own blood, not blood that is redemptive, not blood that came from the cross, but the blood that comes from his enemies when he conquers them as the conquering king. His name is called the Word of God. He is a combative, conquering warrior who comes with the strong Word of God. And he's coming back with an army. Look at verse 14. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Who are they? First of all, they are all the redeemed of all the ages. You and I, if you know the Lord, you're going to be part of that army. You're coming back. Now, we're not going to be armed. The only one that's going to be armed in this army is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only armament that he's going to have is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We'll see that in a moment. But also, not just with the saints who are coming back, all the saints of all the ages, Old, New Testament, whatever, all that believed in the Messiah and they trusted in him and they repented of their sins and they received him as Messiah, Old or New Testament, they're coming back. Those that were saved during the Great Tribulation and were, were uh, killed and slaughtered during the Great Tribulation, they're going to be taken up as well. But look at me, they're all coming back. And then also the angels are coming back. The angels are coming back. All the angels, the myriads of angels, the ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. And again, the only one who's going to be armed is Jesus. Look at verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down all the nations. That sharp sword, we read about that way back in Revelation chapter 1. I read it a moment ago in verse 16. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. What is that two-edged sword? It is the Word of Almighty God. Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the writer of Hebrews talked about it like it was a sword. He said in Hebrews 4, 12, for the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far 
far as the division of soul and spirit, that is when it is proclaimed or when it is shared. Look at me, a lost person does not have a defense. They have a defense against your testimony. They have a defense against your ideas, but they don't have any defense with the word of God. When you share the word of God, it passes. The devil can't stop it. They can't stop it. It pierces their heart like a sword. That's why we don't just need to be preaching and teaching what we believe and what we think. We need to preach and teach and explain and illustrate and apply the Word of God. If we would have 10,000 preachers in America from Maine to Florida to Texas to California to Washington to Minnesota, back to Maine, Alaska, and Hawaii, that would just preach the Word of God, America would have revival within one year. If we would have 10,000 men that would do that, get up and say, thus saith the Lord, and let the Lord look at me. Just turn it loose and let it do its work. You don't have to defend a lion. Just turn it loose. He'll defend himself. Amen? And you don't have to defend the Word of God. I hear all these people say, we need to defend the Word of God. We need to proclaim the Word of God. It will defend itself. It will defend itself. It's the sword of the Spirit. Jesus will defeat them with the sword of the Spirit. And the Bible says when they see Jesus, they're going to bow Philippians 2, 9 through 11, this, for this reason, God highly exalted him. Jesus bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, Jesus, you're the conquering king, and he's also the all-powerful king. Look at verse 15. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He's going to come back, and he's going to start his millennial reign, his 1,000-year reign. We'll talk more about that next week. One of these days, Jesus is going to reign all over the earth from Jerusalem, from his throne in Jerusalem. There will be no more human courts. No more judges, no more lawyers, no more government, no more Senate, no more House of Representatives. Just Jesus. He'll be the only judge and the only king. For a thousand years, he will sovereignly rule and he will sovereignly reign. The capital of the world will be Jerusalem. The court of the world will be Jerusalem. And if anybody disobeys him during that time, that thousand years of peace, There will be judgment from the Lord Jesus, impartial, fair. There won't be any juries. There won't be anything like that. No judges. He will be the only judge there. And it will be fair. It will be swift. It will be severe. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. The Bible says he's not coming back to take sides. He's coming back to take over. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron for a thousand years on this earth the all-powerful king, and he's also the preeminent king. Look at verse 16. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. Here it is, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Oh, Jesus is coming back, and the earth will witness the King of Kings. But there's something else that's going to happen. Not only will the earth witness the King of Kings, the divine King, the judicial king, the all-knowing king, the conquering king, the all-powerful king, the preeminent king. Not only is the earth going to witness the king of kings, but at his second coming, Jesus will wage war, the war of wars. He will wage the war of wars. Let's just quickly look at this war, verses 17 through 21. First of all, this war of all wars, the battle of Armageddon will be ordered by a commander of the war. This is an angel. Look at verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, To all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come, assemble for the great supper of God. Again, by means of a angelos, a heavenly angel, a messenger, God sends forth this sovereign command, and he's standing in the sun. I got to tell you, I've watched a few Western movies in my life, and They set these guys up when they're going to have a duel. A lot of times they'll be walking up the street. How many of you ever seen anything like that? You know what I'm talking about? And they got the sun right behind them. And all you can see is their silhouette. That's what it means. That's exactly what, not not that they have guns and not that they're Western, not that. But when it says, I saw him standing in the sun, he's walking with the sun behind. He's standing there, this angel, and he's giving. You can't see see anything but a silhouette, but you know this is coming from Almighty God. 
It's a glorious thing. And the Bible says he's crying out with a loud voice. And do you know he's talking to birds? He's talking to the carrion birds of prey. He's talking to vultures and crows. Pause a minute. I just want to tell you, I hate crows. If you've got a pet crow, you are in trouble. Please don't tell me if you have a pet crow. I don't like the way they cackle. I don't like the way they look at you. I don't like crows. They're nasty. Just thought I'd share that with you. Buzzards, eagles, I like eagles. Osprey falcons, I like falcons. Hawks, they're okay. Kites, I'm not talking about kites, I'm talking about kites. In the entire world, all of them are going to be commanded to come to the Valley of Armageddon. And you know what? They'll obey. They'll obey. Come and assemble for the great supper of God the commander of the war of wars. And then notice the devastation of the war of wars. Look at verse 18. So that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of the horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. Commanders, mighty men, kings, all, they're going to come alongside the Antichrist, but they're going to be food, for the carrion birds. Antichrist and his false prophet are about to die. All men, free men, slaves, small, great, flesh of horses, those who sit upon them. This is not a meal for people. This is a meal of people. And the people are not going to eat. The birds are. God will strike down the nation using the sword from his mouth. Every anti-Christ and anti-Christian warrior will die and be devoured. The devastation of the war of wars. And then notice the disparity of the war of wars. You say, what does disparity mean? It's just an uneven deal. It's kind of like when a third grade flag football team tries to take on the Dallas Cowboys. No offense, it might be cute, but it would be disastrous if it was for real. There's no chance. There's no chance of them winning. You can't beat the Cowboys if you're just a little third grade flag football team. Well, this army that's going to be the greatest army and man, it kind is ever assembled is going to be like nothing compared to what's about to come through those clouds. Nothing. I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him and who sat on the horse and against his army. I'm going to read to you momentarily out of Psalm 2 that I believe is talking about the battle of Armageddon and the disparity of the two armies. But here's how I think it goes. I don't, I can't quote this. I I just have to believe though that with my sanctified imagination, it's going to be something like this. Antichrist who's full of the devil, literally full of the devil is going to get all these worldly powers together and all these Kings and get them in a room. And he's going to talk to them. He's going to have one really rally, rally cry. And he's going to be saying, guys, Look, we've, we've made a lot of strides here. We've gotten the, the worship going right. Everybody's worshiping me, and through me, they're worshiping the devil on the Mount of Zion, and, and now all of that worship is going right, and we've got the mark of the beast. Man, the economy is booming, and Babylon is just going forth, and we're seeing great things. Now look at me. I, I've got a, a little message. Jesus is coming back, but we can beat him. We don't have, look, you followed me this far. Follow me all the way through, and he believes that he's somehow going to defeat the Christ, the Antichrist does, and somehow this smooth-talking guy 
con- he, he cons all these people and all these guys, they're like a, a young football team getting fired up by a, a speech from a coach and they're ready to go out. And they say, yeah, let's go to the Valley of Armageddon. Yeah, we're going to defeat Jesus. And they follow him down there. He's got his army behind him. Millions of, the greatest army ever in all the history of mankind spread out with their swords drawn, looking up in the sky. And all of a sudden, the sky unfolds and Jesus is on his white horse and every one of them says, "Uh uh-oh. Uh-oh. And the angels, maybe they'll come first. One angel in the Old Testament killed 185,000 bad guys. And there are going to be tens of thousands times tens of thousands of angels come out. And then here comes you and me. Amen. We're going to be on a white horse. You say, I don't even like horses. You'll like them that day. Amen. And you'll be riding on your white horse. And you, nobody's armed but Jesus Nobody, the, the angels have swords, but they're not drawn. They say, this is Jesus' fight. This is not our fight, man. We're just following the Lord. And Jesus is coming back, and that sword of the Spirit is coming out of his mouth, and he's about to speak a word. And look at me. It's going to be a disparity. It's going to be a mismatch, whatever you want to call it. Antichrist is no, no way he can be a conqueror of Jesus. Look at verse 20. And the beast was seized. Wasn't much of a battle, was it? The beast, the Antichrist was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped him. The Bible says in Isaiah 29, about verse 5, about this very time, it says, the multitudes of your enemies, Israel, will become like fine dust, the multitude of the ruthless ones, like the chaff which blows away. It will happen instantly and suddenly. All of a sudden, Jesus, I mean, they've got this huge army out there. He's been bragging about it, no doubt, all over the world. There are cameras out there. Everybody's watching. Oh, he's going to defeat the Christ. Oh, Antichrist. Oh, Antichrist, we worship you. And all of a sudden, Jesus is going to come out and everybody will know uh uh-oh Antichrist doesn't stand a chance and instantly and suddenly he's going to be destroyed now listen to the war of wars prophesied in Psalm 2 why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take their counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's his Christ. That's Jesus saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their courts from us. That's where I got my sanctified imagination a while ago. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury saying, but as for me, I have installed my king. That's Jesus upon Zion. And that's Jerusalem, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. And he has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me. I'll surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show some discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that's Jesus, that he not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. All these earthly armies of Antichrist, they won't stand a chance. Oh, the disparity of this war. And the last thing is this, the reckoning of this war. It's going to be a reckoning. It's going to be a reckoning in your life. There's going to be a reckoning in this world. Look at me. Everybody's wondering, when is justice going to be served? When Jesus comes back. When is righteousness going to be prevailing? When Jesus comes back. We can have all the powwows we want, and I'm all for conversations, and I'm all for trying to get people together, but I got news for you. It's not going to work completely until the Lord Jesus comes back. Until the righteous judge comes back, until the king of peace comes back. That's when righteousness and justice will come back. The reckoning of the war. Look at verse 20. The mid part, it says, these two 
that is the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet, were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. They won't even stand trial before God. They'll just be doomed and sealed, and they'll be cast body and soul into the lake of fire. First mention of the lake of fire in Revelation here is here. And the next three times we read about it in the whole New Testament is in Revelation chapter 20. And then John describes what will happen to the greatest military force mankind ever put together. Here it is, verse 21. The rest were killed with the sword which came out of his mouth. Him who sat on the horse. I don't know what he's going to say. I can just remember, I can't help but speak this. Dr. Rogers, you said, I don't know what he's going to say. I just think he's going to say, drop dead. Amen. Whatever he says, the whole army is going down just with a word from Jesus. And then all the birds will be filled with their flesh. That's the war of all wars. Not because it's the most lengthy war, but because it's the most consequential war. Because after that, Jesus will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. What side are you on? What side are you on? You say, I'm neither. Well, then you're on a side. If you're not on, look at me, if you're not on Jesus' side, if Jesus is not on your side, whichever way you want to say it, you're either for him or you're against him. You're either with him or you're opposing him. You can't have it both ways. Look at me. I'm all for you coming to church, but you can't come in here and then live like the devil all week long and say you're on Jesus' side. Can't do it. Oh, sure, you'll send some. I'm not saying you won't. But you can't have it both ways. He said, well, I'll just get a little Jesus on Sunday, and then I'll go out, and I'll get drunk, and I'll be immoral, and I'll do whatever. I'll cheat and steal and everything else. But I'm a Christian now. I, I prayed a long time ago, and I got baptized, and my grandmother was a Christian. Look at me. That won't cut it. That won't cut it. Do you know the Lord? Do you know him personally? Do you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you looking forward to him coming back? We went to see some grandkids the other day. When they found out we were in, they started saying, Papa, Papa, no, 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 no. They ran and they were just so happy. Look at me. It's going to be a million times like that when Jesus comes back. When Jesus comes back, those who know him are going to say, well, praise the living God. There he is. Hallelujah. I, I've been worshiping you. I've been praying to you. I've been loving you. I've been sharing you all these years. I've been trying to follow you. Even when I messed up, you forgave me. Oh, Jesus, I have been wanting to see you all this time. King of kings, Lord of lords, I bow before you. Amen. That's what's going to happen. You ready for that? Let's bow our heads in prayer. If you don't know the Lord today, I'm asking you to give your heart to Jesus Christ right now. Just pray and repent. Turn from your sin. You do it on your own. Pray and say, Lord, I repent. I, I turn from my sin. Lord, I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you're alive. Come into my life. Save me, Lord Jesus. I receive you. I surrender to you. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Walk with me, talk with me, be my Lord of lords, my King of kings. Do it, Lord. Save me right now. In Jesus' name, oh, Jesus, thank you that you're coming back. In Jesus' name.
Thank you for being here. I know that you've got, uh, y'all don't have anything to say, do you? Did y'all want to say anything? Okay, great. I, was, I, I, tried, I thought you were Drew Tucker for just a second. I, yeah, yeah, that's right. Drew, take it over before I get in trouble. All right, great. You might want to get your eyes checked a little bit. But anyway, Pastor, thank you. Hey, I, I want to say a quick word to our men. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're having a night of worship for our men. I talked to uh, Dr. Jett yesterday, and he's so excited about coming tonight because he really feels like the Lord has given him a word for the men of Bellevue. So whatever your schedule is, I just want to challenge you. I know it's been difficult days uh, since March, but tonight was designed to encourage you. And so if you need a little bit of encouragement and a word from the Lord, you be back tonight at 6 o'clock and I promise you, I don't do this much, but I promise you, I just got a feeling God's going to do something and you'll be encouraged if you'll adjust your schedule and be back with us tonight. And then next Sunday night, the women, we know they'll come, but you men, all right, you need a little extra giddy up, all right? Get, get it here and let's do it, okay? All right? Pastor, where'd he go? I'll just make sure you weren't resurrected, you're still here. Okay. <laughs> All right, get out of here. God bless you. It's been a great day.